Okay, so welcome back. And um, again, um, this is going to be the second half of the Jackson material. So when you're finished with this, that will give you the majority of the stuff that you should be familiar with for the exam. But make sure that you're going back into the full lecture content that's included on Blackboard um, so that you're not missing any of the sort of details or expanded material or anything like that. Um, so when we finished up, we were getting to the point of Jackson being elected in 1828, mentioned some of the sort of questionable dealings that were going on in the previous election of 1824, when Clay and John Quincy Adams sort of seemed to have this arrangement where if Adams is awarded the presidency, Clay would be kind of groomed to be the next president. And this motivates Jackson and his following to organize an opposition party, the Democratic Party. And as you can see in the electoral map here, the Democratic Party does really, really well in the election of 1828. Part of that is because of Jackson himself. Now, Jackson is a um, very, very popular figure. He is regarded because of his role in the War of 1812 as being kind of a second Washington. Um, he was a military figure who led the victorious American and sort of ragtag group that wins the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. And he suddenly becomes a celebrity as a result. And he gains additional notoriety and popularity because of his handling of um, Native American uprisings in parts of Tennessee and Georgia and the Carolinas and Florida. Um, and so he is a very popular figure. When he gets elected, as I mentioned in the last um, lecture set, he, he really does contribute to the transformation of the office of the presidency. He believes that the president is sort of the representative of the people. Now, obviously, whenever we say the people in a situation like this, we're referring to who? Well white men. And so he's not terribly concerned with women's issues. He's not terribly concerned with non-whites. So that would include um, Native Americans and African Americans, most notably. But he is definitely of the impression that the president is responsible for speaking on behalf of the people. It is the only office in national politics that, again, quote unquote, all the people vote on. And so he believes that it's his responsibility to kind of guide the direction of national politics. Constitutionally, the part of the government that's responsible for actually making laws is Congress. The president is actually responsible for making those laws happen, right? That's why the president's branch is called the executive branch. The president and all of now, all of the offices that are part of the executive branch are responsible for executing the laws that Congress makes. Jackson believes that he needs to guide the country because the people as a whole have selected him to be the person leading the nation. So Jackson turns the presidency into a much more active part of government. He begins to um, sort of advance his own legislative agenda. He starts to um, send bills to Congress that he wants them to pass instead of just waiting in the White House until Congress has passed a bill. 
and then it reaches his desk and he has to sign it or veto it. In this case, Jackson is using the office of the president to exert a certain legislative agenda that is not necessarily in line with what congressional leadership want. He also uses the veto power more than any president before him combined. So he's not only saying, here's the things that I want you to do, do them. He's also saying, I don't like what you are doing, I'm going to kill it off. So Jackson is, he's a controversial figure even at the time, because there are a number of people, even in his own party, not just in the opposition, who feel that Jackson is taking too much control over the operation of the government. And this is still a time, remember, that's barely 50 years after the creation of the Constitution. So this is still a time when it's kind of sensitive about how the Constitution is going to work and how it's going to be put into practice. And one of the ways that that really gets sort of expressed is in the issue of what power does the government actually have. Prior to Jackson's time in office, there is a Supreme Court case called McCullough versus Maryland, and that happens in 1819. And this is a case that is uh, in the Supreme Court under the chief justiceship of a guy named John Marshall. And John Marshall is almost without question the most important Supreme Court chief justice ever. He's at the helm of the court for some of the really essential decisions that the court makes. And one of those is this McCullough versus Maryland. And McCullough versus Maryland basically boils down to, does the government have power beyond what is specifically written in the Constitution? This is the question of what are called implied powers. And it also raises the issue of what's called strict constructionism. So in McCullough versus Maryland, Marshall and the court say, there are sort of loopholes that are worded into the Constitution that give the government power beyond the specific details of what you can read directly in the document itself. And these implied powers mean that Congress and or the President can sort of fudge a little bit what they want to do and still claim that it falls within, it's called the Necessary and Proper Clause. Basically, that's a place in the Constitution that it lists what Congress can do, and then it says, and then Congress can do the things that are necessary and proper in order to kind of do their job. And so Marshall and the court say, you've got some wiggle room if you want to do a thing that isn't specifically listed in the Constitution's sort of list of allowed responsibilities or allowed powers. And Jackson has sort of this um, prickly relationship with the idea of implied powers because he personally is what's called a strict constructionist. And anybody that follows politics knows that political ideology and dogmatism really only last as far as what a person needs once they get into politics. In other words, Jefferson was what was called a strict constructionist. He believed that the president only had the powers that were in the Constitution, but when it comes to the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson blows all that out the window and he says, oh, you know what? I really needed to finish up this deal with France to get Louisiana, so we'll just kind of fudge things around a bit. Jackson is kind of the same way. 
Jackson is a strict constructionist, but he also takes a much more active, borderline unconstitutional role in sort of guiding the legislative agenda. But he does, in other cases, operate as a strict constructionist. For one, he says, if there are laws, if there are bills that Congress passes that I think don't fall in line with constitutional allowances of government power, I'm going to veto them. And one of those happens in 1830. Congress passes a bill that says, we're going to give some money to help build a road in Kentucky. Now, mind you, Kentucky, again, is the home state of the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay. You remember him from 1824 and the corrupt bargain. This is a road that is entirely inside the bounds of the state of Kentucky. And constitutionally, Congress is allowed to get involved in regulating interstate trade, not intrastate. Intrastate would be all inside one state. Interstate, like the highway system, connects one state to another. So Jackson says, if you look at the Constitution, the Constitution clearly says that only things that involve more than one state can be eligible for Congress to be making laws about. And so he says, I'm going to veto, I'm going to kill off this funding bill that would have helped pay for this road just inside the state of Kentucky. It was known as the Maysville Road, and so his veto of that bill is known historically as the Maysville Road Veto. So it's a good example of Jackson saying, I don't believe that Congress has the power to do a thing that's not in the Constitution. Again, mind you, he's doing this at the same time that he is instituting certain legislative ideas in ways that aren't specifically said in the Constitution were part of the president's role either. Another example, one that's probably more famous in terms of history books, but is way more complicated, and so we'll just do the thumbnail sketch, is the Second Bank of the United States. So long story short, in the early years of the U.S. government, they decide to create a bank, a national bank, and it manages to last for a while, and then it sort of evaporates. And they create it again, the second bank of the United States. This is intended to kind of be a financial clearinghouse that can help regulate the economy and help um, determine the, the supply of money in the country and all kinds of things. Long story short, because you don't need all of the details behind it, and I'm not an economic historian, so some of it is Greek to me, Jackson says, nowhere in the Constitution does it say that Congress has the specific power that it can create a bank, because that's who had to charter it in the first place, was Congress. Jackson says, show me the place in the Constitution that it says word for word, if Congress wants to create a bank, Congress can charter a bank. It's not in there. So Jackson kills it off, right? He vetoes the attempt by Congress to recharter the bank. He has other personal kinds of issues with it as well. He believes that it favors certain um, economic interests in the country. He feels that it sacrifices the economic interests of other groups in the country, but certainly in the um, sort of legal justification that he gives, he says it's not in the Constitution that Congress has the ability to do this. So 
this question of strict constructionism, it's going to be something that is kind of a challenge that Jackson faces during his presidency. But he is always sort of in his mind seeing himself as the representative of the people. And <clears throat> his emergence as a major national political figure is going to coincide, and in some ways it's, it's kind of, his emergence is kind of responsible for the sort of amazing growth in popular participation in politics. So today, people are constantly driving around with bumper stickers and um, putting signs in their front yard and going to, you know, young Democrat or young Republican meetings, you know, all that stuff. And candidates today, you know, go all over the place to have rallies. In the 18-teens and 1820s and 1830s, that wasn't the case. It was a much more formal kind of thing. And Jackson becomes a candidate around the time when different states are relaxing the rules on political participation. So, according to the Constitution and state laws in the 1780s, 90s, 1800s, you had to be a property owner before you could vote. The thinking was, this was the thing that gave you a reason to make a good decision, right? If you don't have a stake in what a politician is going to do, because politics is based on protecting property and all of that, if you don't have property, you don't have anything to lose. Well, in the 1820s and 1830s, states like Ohio, and especially other Western states, because yes, Ohio in the 1820s and 30s is a Western state, those states begin to say, we want more people to be participating in politics. We want the system to be more democratic, right? Including more people. Only white people, yes. Only white men, yes. But still, it is a change. And Jackson is very popular in the West, in the South, in those states that are opening up that process to more individuals. And so you see mass meetings, you see newspapers, you see political speeches. Jackson himself doesn't can, uh, campaign, not the way the presidential candidates today do. But it is still a big change from what came before. So you see the introduction and the use of nicknames and campaign slogans. And you've got posters like the one here that really emphasize the role of the people, right? Jackson is the man of the people. He didn't barter or bargain for the presidency, right? A reference back to that corrupt bargain of 1824. Power and politics and, and victory should be derived from the people, right? And so it's a lot of this kind of popular appeal to what the people can provide and what the people represent. And that's one of the things that makes Jackson oftentimes rise on the level of American politics and American presidents, even though a lot of his personal views were pretty rough around the edges. Um, another thing that tends to kind of enhance his position in terms of the list of American presidents is his fairly strong position regarding the power of the states versus the power of the national government. So, in the year of his second presidential election, 1832, Jackson faces a, a pretty serious crisis, the nullification crisis. Basically, Congress has passed a tariff, 
And what is a tariff? Well, a tariff is a basically like an import-export tax. And in this case, it's a tariff that South Carolina feels um, sort of unfairly and unequally affects them more than other parts of the country. So Jackson's vice president, one of those early founders of the Democratic Party, John C. Calhoun, is from South Carolina. And he says he personally doesn't agree with the tariff. He feels that the state, any state, but in this case South Carolina, should have the right and does have the right to disregard, to reject, to nullify any law that that state feels is unconstitutional. And in this case, then, it becomes South Carolina saying, this is a law that we don't agree with. We're going to not abide by it. What he's saying, essentially, is that the state is more powerful than the federal government, right? That a state, instead of doing what the federal government requires, the state can do whatever it wants. This is the kind of idea that will start to become an issue or will remain an issue, um, but will get even more extreme in the 1850s leading up to the, the secession of the, the breaking of the Union in 1860 and 61, which will ultimately be the Civil War. Jackson says, oh, and that, as we'll see, will also be South Carolina kind of taking the lead in it. Jackson says, no, the national government takes precedence, the national government is supreme, the state cannot decide not to do a thing just because they don't want to, and Jackson threatens the use of military force against South Carolina. He says, you will abide by this tariff, you will abide by this tax, and if you don't, I'm going to use the army. Congress kind of finds a middle ground. Congress, on the one hand, passes what they call a force bill. The force bill says the president has the right to use the army against South Carolina if he needs to. But at the same time, Congress also passes a new tariff. And this new tariff kind of gives South Carolina a way to save face. It says, South Carolina, here's a slightly revised tax. It's not significantly different, but Jackson makes it very clear that if South Carolina chooses not to abide by this new law, he's going to use force. And so South Carolina backs down. Nullification is not coming out of nowhere, right? This whole question of states' rights, the question of whether the state or the national government is supreme, um, goes way back, and it will go way forward. Even today, there are instances where that federalist system, the federalism idea of national, state, local, um, can be problematic, right? Recent times, you've got states that make decisions and laws regarding um, gun control or emissions and environmental issues. And you have more recently, especially in the current administration, efforts at punishing those states for making laws that don't align with what the president and the executive branch want. But it goes way back, right? One of the early expressions of this idea that states have the power to just ignore and sort of constitutional review um, laws that the national government create. Some of the earliest examples go all the way back to the 1790s 
when Thomas Jefferson and James Madison are trying to work against the John Adams presidency, and they say, how dare Adams um, and the Adams Congress pass what were known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. And basically they say in their, um, their own sort of essays called the Kentucky Resolution or the Virginia Resolution, together they're known as the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions, Jefferson and Madison actually argue um, at the end of the 1700s that states have the right to reject federal law. Well, one of the other things that John Marshall does as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in a case called Marbury versus Madison, he says the Supreme Court is the part of the government that reviews whether a law is constitutional. Now that decision isn't going to be until the early 1800s, and he's taking that power, again, kind of ironically, it's not said anywhere in the Constitution, but Marshall says, obviously that's what the founders wanted. We, the Supreme Court, are going to take that power for ourselves. So that's a little after Jefferson and Madison, right? When Jefferson and Madison are writing their, their resolutions, there is no judicial review yet. But when nullification happens, when that crisis happens in the 1830s, Marshall has already clearly established that as policy, right? As a, a part of the government system. And so, and in the 1830s, the Supreme Court is the part of the government that has the power to review laws as being constitutional or not. So Calhoun is really overstepping things, but he's basing it on a, a useful interpretation that had already been put out there by two of the most important sort of political, ideological, philosophical thinkers in American history, and he's saying states have that right. So this is one of the areas where Jefferson or Jackson really establishes himself um, as a, a president to be aware of. And for people that support the idea of national power, Jackson's position is pretty high here. But as I said, Jackson is definitely a problematic kind of a figure. And one of the areas where that will be fully revealed is in his um, handling of Native American issues, right? Indian affairs. So you're going to be listening to some podcasts and things about the Trail of Tears. So I'm not going to go into it a lot here. It's also covered to some extent in the full PowerPoints that are on Blackboard as well. Um, but just to kind of set the scene for Jackson, Jackson is what's known in the 1800s as an Indian fighter, right? He builds some of his reputation on waging war, literally waging war, against Native American nations in Tennessee, in the Carolinas, um, and especially in Florida. And there is a particular event that kind of sets off the process that you'll be learning about from the uh, podcasts, and that is the discovery of gold in Georgia in the late 1820s. Now, Jackson, generally speaking, is very pro-South and pro-West. So he gains support among people in New England and in the Mid-Atlantic states and in the Chesapeake, but he's really um, sort of a man of the people, quote-unquote. And the people that he really, really sort of leans towards are those Southerners and Westerners. And he wants to do whatever he can to provide opportunities for them. And in this case, 
he sees Native Americans in general as being an impediment, right? How dare they be out there not using the land, not being Christian, not being white, not speaking English, and preventing us good Christian, English-speaking white people from having access to that land. And so the discovery of gold in Georgia is a great opportunity for him to kind of take advantage of a particular incident that he can use to um, advance his more general idea of opportunities for whites. And so he sees this as a chance to remove Native Americans completely from the Southeast and allow that land to be opened up for white settlement and at the same time allow for easier control and um, subjugation of Native Americans. Now, a lot of the people in Georgia and the Carolinas and, and Florida are part of what were known as the Five Civilized Tribes. So the Five Civilized Tribes were the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, the Cherokee, and the Seminole. And they were called this because, to varying degrees, they were more in tune. They had adopted more American ways, right? whether it's speaking English, whether it's the way they dress, whether it's the kind of um, jobs that they do. So these were Native Americans who were already kind of closer to being assimilated, assimilated into the white culture. But that's still not enough because they're not white. And so Jackson gets Congress to pass what's called the Removal Act of 1830. And basically this says, um, in no uncertain terms, Native Americans need to give up their claim to that land, whites will be able to annex it, to take it for themselves, and it will be sort of putting in place a version of reservations, right? removing Native Americans from one area to another area so that they will be out of the way, open up that space for white settlement, but it's also couched in terms of, well, this is going to be better for them because it will remove them from sort of white antagonism and white violence, and it will allow them to maintain their culture in the face of sort of overwhelming pressure from white settlers. In reality, those are all just smoke shows that are smoke screens that are meant to um, obscure the reality of this is removal to get rid of Native Americans so that it can open that space up for white settlement. So, that's the point now where those podcasts on the Trail of Tears will pick up, and you're going to need to listen to those because this is content that will be part of the exam just like anything else. This is going to be the end of the um, Jackson material that I've recorded for. Again, make sure you're looking at that stuff that's on Blackboard, the full, long-term, complete PowerPoint slides about Jackson. There's going to be stuff on the exam that will come from both of those, both this and those slides. Um, this is all you're responsible for in terms of sort of new content, as it were, for the week. Make sure you review the email that I'm sending to kind of outline a plan of attack for the next few weeks. And um, the exam is going to be due at the end of the week on, on Saturday, so make sure you get that in. There is a multiple choice component that is entirely within Blackboard, so make sure you're answering those questions, and that'll be graded automatically. Make sure then that you're uploading your exam answers for the ID and essay questions directly into the submission tool. Those have to be either Word or PDF so that I can see them. I'll grade those and put the scores in Blackboard for you as well. 
next week then is spring break. And so it is officially no classes, no nothing. I'll be using that week to build some other content in the course. And so those things will start to appear. Um, but you're not responsible for doing anything during spring break. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, I wouldn't recommend going traveling, but if you do, please be safe. Please have a good time. Um, and keep in mind, this is kind of an unusual situation. So it's not the, the regular kind of go anywhere, do anything kind of spring break. But, um, you know, I hope I can see, as it were, all of you back here again and make sure that you are keeping on top of these recorded lectures. I'm going to keep them in the 20 to 30 minute range as much as I can. This one went a little bit long, but um, I appreciate your patience and I appreciate your, your attention, and I will see you on the flip side.